Okay, this week I have the pleasure of introducing you to somebody that I've gotten to know over the last couple of months. He's been working with uh, Andrew Pask and myself uh, and the Cycling 74 team. Dealing with the code base of Max, he's been a fantastic guy to work with, but he also does a lot of incredible work in the real world, and I really wanted to get a chance to talk to him about his stuff. His name is David Butler. He has one of the coolest website names ever, which is the impersonalstereo.com. That's where you can find out more information about him. But we're going to learn a little bit about him today and talk to him about his work. So with that, I'm going to say hi to David. Hi, David. How's it going? Hi, Lauren. Good to be here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know you're really hella busy right now. You're, you're in London at the moment, right? Well, London right now. I live in London uh, most of the time, but uh, spend a, a good proportion of uh, of it uh, in various places working on projects. Yeah, so you're you're a hotel guy, some, huh? Yeah, a lot, a lot of hotels, a lot of uh, trying to find a you know decent restaurant in, a, <laughs> in right. the vicinity. Yeah, sure. So why don't you why don't we kick this off by having you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing? Because I find it pretty fascinating. Uh, yeah. So I'm like. I would say I like a video guy primarily, and that's and that's my kind of professional side, and also partly my academic background. But that was a little bit more wide ranging. But my um, in my day job, I work for a company called uh, Green Hippo. We make what uh, we call uh, media servers. That tends to be a, like a word that's kind of a little confusing to unless you're directly in the entertainment industry, but. In the entertainment industry, what we uh, call a media server is essentially just a specialized computer for doing live video playback and processing, usually controlled kind of like it was a, a complicated kind of light. It's all about like kind of live video playback processing, uh, and you know, kind of so that's used on like like live live gigs, and, and actually I do a lot of integration work in kind of installations in theme parks and things like that, theater. So it's it's all about like th- th- about pr- processing video live, playing back, sometimes taking kind of live inputs or doing generative stuff. I work for them doing projects, installations, and working a bit on the software side as well. Sure, this is kind of interesting because to me, you hit on something that uh, for a long time I've I've wondered if it was going to be a thing, which is the use of live video as sort of an alternative or maybe an adjunct to lighting to lighting systems it seems almost natural but for a long time i think projectors just weren't up to the job right yeah it's um it's an interesting kind of collision was where from again is I, I mean a lot my background is a lot in in theater and that's kind of where i came into it came into this industry and it was interesting to see how specifically in theater video and the idea of the video department evolved uh, and it, it happened differently in different institutions depending on the kind of work they were doing but in, in some places it kind of came out of lighting and it's like video and video is treated like it's a complicated it's a complicated kind of light <laughs> and it's and in some places which tend to be the places that were doing more more they were doing some video work initially with kind of where it was just about like you know connecting up dvd players or um, no, you know, no computer stuff at all. It's just like literally routing signals around. The, they treated it much more as something that was part of the sound department because, in terms of the actual work that was being done, it was most similar to that. And that was, it's, you know, so it's more like the AV side or like the the lighting video side. Yeah, that's interesting. So, which side did you feel more com- do you feel more comfortable with? I, I definitely come from the, the, the from the lighting side um, because that was how I that was, that was my initial kind of stuff that I did in, from a third perspective. I I prefer that approach because it's it's much more concerned of if you think about the difference between what you're just doing when you're doing like sound design or lighting design. With sound design, most of the time you're creating a a wave file. You're creating a waveform. You're gonna you're gonna cr- finish that, get it how you want, and then you're gonna save it to disc. And then during the show, it's just going to be played back. So you're doing your sound design kind of offline in a lot right. of cases. I mean, sometimes you might be, if you're getting more complicated, you might be mixing things together like live and, you know, balancing stuff. But mostly it's about, like, you know, taking, making pre-rendered stuff sure. and, and, and playing it back. Whereas lighting is, 
it's hardly, I mean, you've got fixed lighting fixtures, you're going to put them in a position in a venue, and then you're going to try to build the show from that position. So you can't come with anything besides maybe some, some idea of what the programming is like, but it's going to have to vary. So lighting, in a sense, is that's it's doing it live you're you're when you go into the into a venue and you program the light show you're creating everything there it's it's specific for that thing and there's no concept of a pre-rendered lighting show it's all all every every instruction's being executed in real time right right that that second way is is one of the things i feel strongly about is the way to is the way to do flexible shows and the way to be to be more creative in a sense and i've been a lot of my work is about taking that approach and trying to apply and trying to see how we can apply it to to video design, to uh, and to and to sound design as well. In the same sense of saying, well, we don't have to have everything rendered and, and ready, and just just you don't have to just have a show that's based around playback. You can have a show that's based around manipulating things live, and you know, uh, and if you know, you you do a show and you go, you know, I want I want to move that, I want to change the level of that sound, I want to change the quality of that sound. You can go in, tweak some parameters, and do that without having to like create a whole new static kind of monolithic file you've got it's, it's something that's flexible right well what it also seems like too is then you end up kind of a modern version of the conductor and the pit orchestra all at one all as one except you're dealing with media content instead of a bunch of musicians right yeah exactly yeah it's it's like yeah it, it, that's a good analogy in fact the uh, yeah the you are the you're the conductor you know, for any for any media, for not just for sound, but for the conductor, for the video, the light show, the the audio, yeah, and like you know, in traditional traditional pit orchestras, yeah, you'd never. We started recording sound because it meant you know, in for limitations where we couldn't or couldn't afford to employ an orchestra, it was right. a way to do the same thing. But mm -hmm. if you could instead have have virtual musicians, in fact, that would be give you more flexibility in that sense. Sure, that would be ideal, right? Now. And, uh, to apply that the, the kind of concept of okay for stuff that it wouldn't possible to be performed with a musician, All right. uh, more modern kind of electronic sound design concepts where sure. you know it's not just you couldn't equate it to a person playing an instrument. So for people that aren't used to these show control environments, what does the tooling look like? I mean, when you sit down, you know, up in the booth getting ready for a show, what's sitting in front of you? To say that from from a from a lighting console point per perspective for how that would work you so you, you start off the first thing you do is you say okay well I've got all my these various lighting fixtures you put in addressing information over them and you set up the basic communication and then it's that you're usually kind of then plot you start off by plotting in various kind of base looks or whatever you would go you would go from and that and at that point then you're probably getting into the show and then you you know you 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 go through the show gradually change make changes see how things actually look it's a very kind of responsive environment because it's entirely based on you being actually in the place looking at the result and going through it with in context of the rest of the show and that is true as much for for video as well on most shows video is also programmed using a lighting console and again you're treating the the oh, video yes. system like it's a like it's a very complicated light in a sense. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and it's and that's really because the lighting consoles yeah, it's like in a sense, you know, they're designed for controlling lighting instruments. But really and this is something that I did a lot of research on partly when I was doing my masters, is this idea of just a thing for for doing show control, a a, a show control programmer that was more generalized in a sense. You're just taking you're taking parameters and you're applying a, a sort of sequencing to them, and in in the console in light console terms, that's more normally a queue based sequencing parameter. Right. You're saying this happens at this queue, and in right. this queue, this parameter fades up and fades down, and does does this and other stuff. But I've been actually looking at the kind of that idea of how can you take that concept and just say, well, what I'm controlling isn't a light. Maybe it's audio. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's video. Maybe it's like it's something physical. And because they're all, you know, ultimately maybe dealing with you know different different actual um things in different areas but really the control is all you're doing the same thing it's all just numbers you're equating everything to numbers changing over time sure so then these media servers that you create these are just like computing or playback devices that somehow can respond to uh what the lighting console is able to put out yeah, so uh, I mean, lighting, lighting consoles traditionally use um, DMX-based mm -hmm. protocols. Right. Now it's more normally 
DMX over uh, DMX protocols that are IP based, so of things like ArtNet and right. um, SATN. But it's the same information, and it's a really simple protocol, which is just like 512 8 bit numbers. So it's actually a lot more primitive than even stuff in the, like you more, maybe used to in the audio world, like OSC or right. uh, MIDI. You know, there's no kind of differentiating different kinds of messages. You literally just send numbers <laughs> at a frame rate. It's very, very thing. primitive. It's one of my, in fact, one of my biggest bugbears is that in in you know this protocol was invented in like the in mid 80s, right. and in all the uh, all the time we have not managed to create anything better, which is universally supported. But right. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, so you also mentioned that you get involved in some of the coding and some of the programming aspects of this. Uh, what kind of coding work is involved in, in bringing this stuff together? I do a lot of coding, obviously, at, at work and as kind of my own personal projects. I'm, I'm interested in making stuff for the, the kind of things I'm interested in, like which is the purposes of, of show control and for creating like interfaces for to enable kind of creativity in those aims. I work it's a lot of kind of stuff that's more you know utility based like we need this we need the um for this for an upcoming project we might need to speak to a particular piece of equipment so I'll write something to enable that right right I I don't really get so much into the kind of heavy graphics part because that's like like that's where it starts to go a little over my head the the interface and the kind of communication side of it is where I'm where what I'm interested in well, I think the first time that you and I ran across each other was when I was doing some work on the uh, JIT cell block object in Max, and you were kind of using that as a tool for doing like some pretty massive switching or something, as I recall. It seemed like one of the things I noticed was the way that you were talking about it was that you were talking in terms of relatively massive scope in comparison to most people I talked to. When you're When you're putting together a show of some significant size how many devices are you actually working with it, it depends very much on the project video in terms of compared to like more traditional lighting stuff video tends to you start eating up the channels in a dmx term so like in you know 512 universes uh, sorry 512 channels on, on on dmx is one universe and like a mid, you know, a mid-sized show might use, you know, just with with just lights, maybe kind of three, four universes. It depends if they're using kind of moving lights. If they if they're using just normal like dimmers, just single channel stuff, then only probably only one. Okay. Uh, but moving lights tend to eat up more, more than that, like you know, kind of thirty, forty, even more, and and more if depending on their complexity. Per light. Yeah, video video servers um, tend to go way above that because then we, I mean, for a start. Because we do everything, all our control is is Ethernet based as opposed to like serial cables. We're not restricted on the amount of data that can be sent to us. Oh, right. It's more gen just a kind of licensing restriction on for the because the, the the cheaper consoles can only send so much data at once mm -hmm. as that kind mm -hmm. of software licensing. Um, so then we'll, we'll go into like if you've got like you're trying to do a video server with um, sixteen layers, then each each layer might be ninety channels. So then it gets it adds up pretty quickly. If you start to then do pixel mapping based stuff where you're using a video signal to drive the colors of lights in a kind of a via, via DMX, so you're not outputting a video signal, you're outputting a DMX signal, then that get, can get really crazy because essentially you've then got like three, four channels for every light. And you might have, I think the biggest project I've done so far was about 800 universes. Oh my God. Yeah, and they actually cabled every single one of those individually. So that was quite funny. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's one of those where you probably just end up imagining, you know, like you're dreaming of cables all night, every night. Yeah, right? I wasn't I wasn't on site for that one. I was, yeah, uh, good but for I you. saw the racks that they built <laughs> that was just doing this conversion from Ethernet to serial DMX. Oh, and it was, okay. yeah, it was insane. That's <laughs> was wild. Fun. I was troubleshooting the cables for that one. Unreal. So I'm curious now because you you've kind of opened a little bit of an insight into the kind of broad range of interests and kind of capabilities that you have and I'm really curious one of the things I like doing on my podcast is kind of exploring how people came to become the artists that they are right how they got involved in the technology how they got involved involved in the art side uh, where their passions lie. I'm, I'm always really curious about that. And you're doing a really big variety of stuff and also kind of in the neck of the woods that I don't normally 
I don't normally talk to people from, from there. So I'm curious for you, what is your background and how did you get to the point where you felt like this was your passion, this was your place? I was originally, uh, when I was probably about 16, I was kind of got interested in sound and audio recording. Uh, I always had like, you know, kind of computing based interests and I was a musician. So that kind of seemed like a natural combination of the two, those two areas. So I did, did a lot of sound recording, did a lot of engineering, and I was going to, to university to, to study that. And I then, in between, I did a summer job at the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, because, you know, thinking, as, you know, I can, uh, they, they, there's a lot of like, live sound mixing, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm involved with that, and I thought, oh, this would be, you know, something, something to do over the summer and could be int- um, interesting in terms of getting some experience. What I discovered there at that, that summer was that sound for theatre in particular is really, really dull. <laughs> <laughs> So I've I've always been interested in in like the live side of the live side of things as opposed to the the recording side of things more, and so you know. But for a lot of theatre shows, you literally you know you, like you see uh, the, you, I was like the lighting guy sitting next to me, and they'll they you know the the shows come in and they say they roll up to him with a cue list and say all right, you need you to program this this and this, and it's like oh, we got this. And I have this massive long conversation about it, and I'm sat next to him, and the audio guy comes up to me and hands me a CD and says right tracks one to ten. <laughs> play them at these times in the show (laughs) (laughs) and so uh, as a result of that uh, I started to get more and more into the lighting side of things and was like and by the end of that kind of month and a half was really like got fairly up to speed on that and then I carried on with that once I got to university the the, I went to I went to uh, Lancaster University by the way and it would the course there was it was a music technology but it was very very composition focused so we were using we were using max primarily i'd already i already knew max from bits and pieces that i'd done it was very open and you know you could all the coursework was based around kind of you know making some sort of kind of interactive pieces it was generally a vague theme but you really could choose kind of whatever you wanted to do and i started to do stuff involving involving lighting and involving video and very kind of multidisciplinary work I was kept kept up, carry on, you know, with uh, my interest in theatre and working in theatre. Doing at that point, I was doing kind of lighting, I was doing sound, I was doing video. Then and through Max, I started to do a lot of kind of custom customizations and writing little applications and utilities for people. And I started to investigate some of the DMX stuff to, stuff for Max. Started to build some of my own ex, my Max externals for for, do, for trying to achieve the things I was trying to achieve. At, at that point, there was a few objects for doing DMX. There was just it was just limited to kind of the input output side. There was no no really kind of things to actually deal with it once you've got it into the application. Right. I also around that time wrote my um, uh, DMX system, uh, which is a that was about the time Max for Live had come out. I thought, well, you know, this is like this is a really great way for me to be able to do to actually program lighting alongside Ableton sets. So I've just, you know, made some really simple devices to be able to um, take pra- Ableton parameters and put and map them to the Max channels, and uh, did that, used that on a few shows, and then, yeah, it just kind of evolved, evolved from that point of like me like t- trying to to find ways to do th- to do things that I was presented with, and working on my own kind of personal coursework, which in the end, kind of my last piece was very, very video focused. Uh, it was kind of like a, it's actually, I bet, uh, you can watch the video on my website, but it was a, a, a dance piece we did using 3D visuals in the kind of, to do a kind of holographic effect. And that was like as much as an exercise in kind of show control as it was if a video or audio, because it was like the, or about, had about three machines all linked together. Though, and all kind of with the you know the lighting, the uh, video components, the audio components, all kind of running um, on connected systems. I put in the control light for everything kind of simultaneously, so I could kind of consider the effect of everything at once, which was an interesting way to work compared to kind of these sort of more focused disciplinary methods you would usually use. Right. right. Of all the things that you've worked on, what is the thing that that is most exciting to you? What I mean, do you? It seems like you you really you were kind of drawn in by lighting and stuff like this, but you're getting a chance to work with video. But you also have this background in sound and even music. What's the thing that still gets gets you revved up every time you get a chance to work on it? So yeah, anything with um, interesting kind of control uh, problems. Often that comes from kind of interactive things where you're trying to you're trying to do a show that takes a kind of more input than just this, you know, press a button to advance to the next part of the show to fire a cue at this point. 
where you're trying to make things more dynamic. Uh, one thing that I've developed, um, as, and there's another kind of Ableton module, is a thing called MSC for Live, <coughs> which is a way to do queue based control of Ableton live sets. And this MSC is a protocol for like queue commanding, MIDI right. show control. And so that way you can kind of link in to either to, to a lighting desk or to any other system that can communicate those queue commands, link that into uh, the wider show control system to command your Ableton set, which means that then you can start to kind of think of the Ableton session as like a server for providing sound and for keeping, and also then obviously the quantization comes into the point. So you can say, I want to command this, that we need to start ramping this down now, and it will happen when it's kind of musically appropriate. So that's kind of, that's sort of semi, it's kind of interactivity, maybe not in a way a lot of people would define interactivity, but I think it's interactive because it's about responding to, being, being able to take what, like something that's pre-programmed and respond to what's actually happening in a real environment. So those right. kind of things interest me a lot. Yeah. Uh, anything that's slightly out of, the, out, of, out of ordinary in that sense. You brought up interactivity, and so right away I started thinking, I, I've worked with dancers a bunch in the past, and dancers are like fascinated with this idea of having like interactivity being like bend controllers on their elbows and stuff like that, which I always was able to, you know, I, I think mostly by making really sad crying sounds, I was <laughs> able to get them to not consider it. Uh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. It, it's, uh, I find with so, I, this happens a lot uh, with much less interesting projects uh, in my kind of professional life when people, we have people come to us and say, right, we want to do this. We want to do a show. We want to do this, this, and this. And we want it to be, and all they just say at the end, and we want it to be interactive. Right. And I say, well, like, what, what do you mean by that? Or what, what do you want? And it's like, oh, I don't know. Just, we want, we want to have, and usually what they mean is they want, like, people to be able to kind of wave their hands and have stuff happen. Right. But I find that that often is, it, it's, if you think about like what you're trying to set up when you when you're you're creating the control system for it, control data for a show when you're kind of programming it, you're trying to do that with some kind of kind of an, an artistic bent, or like a vision of what should happen when you're trying to make something that's um, that you know is, is the best way it could be presented, and then to kind of throw in is this idea of interactivity in for fixed shows into into the mix, then I find often. Just ends up you, you you just you you know what you want and you know and generally it's going to be the same mo or nearly the same every single night but you've then got this kind of uncertainty in it. I've seen things where so many cases where interactivity could be could be replaced by just more rehearsal, right. where, people, where you've got a show where <laughs> someone's standing in the same spot on stage every night, <laughs> right. and they, and but at some point someone's decided right we want this to be interactive so you've got all sorts of stuff with cameras and you're tracking this person you're trying to make stuff follow them and happen but ultimately it's the same show every night as a fixed show yeah. so it's like you could save a lot of bother if you just replaced that with with, with a, a few with the video to make right. sure that he was absolutely standing in the same spot every night <laughs> and then you're absolutely going to get what you've what you've programmed as opposed to maybe what you've programmed as long as everything goes okay. Right. Well, the other one that I always get a kick out of is when people want, like, interaction from the audience. And I'm just like, you know, the most popular emoticon now is that smiling turd. And so, <laughs> so unless something about your show really wants to embrace the equivalent of the smiling turd, I'm not actually sure that you want the voice of the people, you know, being highlighted in your show. Uh, but yes. that and, seems to be a thing, and I think it's I think it's sort of like shallow thinking, which is like yeah. people are like, I want to involve the audience. Uh, let's let them tweet in, right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's like I think it misunderstands kind of the point of you, you're you're presenting something, and not to you know not to be this kind of like dic sort of dic dictator about it, but like the audience have come to watch the show that I'm presenting. Right. So the only, the only interactive thing which I was really, really inspired by and actually did have done some kind of work using similar ideas was a theater piece which was presented while I was at university. It was in, in the theater on campus by a group called Gulp Squad, uh, Gulp Squad's Kitchen, where they essentially, it was a very kind of improvised on their part a theater piece where at very, uh, there were four performers and at points throughout the show they gradually replaced themselves with members of 
of the audience, but they gave the members of the audience a headset, and then the performer sat in the audience and just told them what to say <laughs> via a microphone. And I love that concept because oh, it was God. it was interactive. You were involving the audience. However, you still maintained absolute control over what was actually happening. It was still the show you intended to present. That's great. I've tried to do some 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 works kind of exploring that idea. This is the, it's perhaps the only solely audio works that I've done. Because I see it as an extension of a kind of the ideas of show control. Sure. So I've um, I've done uh, pieces whereby, which I, I like to characterize as electronic music with no electronic output components. There is no actual speakers or or, or electronic system amplification systems involved, but it's basically people all wearing headphones being, and we, I play tones in their ears, and they have to reproduce the tone vocally. Oh, but the entire the entire system is like a max max based um, system, which is giving them instructions from a set score. That's actually really fascinating. That's a cool idea because that's like using I don't know. I'm always fascinated by things that uh, that use kind of peculiar conduits, especially if the conduit ends up being a person, a person having to interpret something. You know, whether it's an instruction on one of these creative cards. Or it's, uh, you know, it's a graphic score. Or in this case, you know, you feeding stuff literally into uh, into a headset or something. It seems like there's a lot of interesting stuff where a person ends up being the instrument that that uh, produces produces the sound, and there's that interpretation that's required by that person. Yeah, I liked I, I liked also the idea that. Um, you could have, if you were going to present this in a formal context, you you could just have you could just pick people out of the audience to do it. And right. in a sense, you've got a person who is, while they are a performer, they're also a member of the audience because they're getting a different experience right. there from the rest of the audience. But they are still, even though they're they're performing it, they're still an audience member and they're still listen, they're still um, hearing the work in a, just in a different way. Sure. Out of, out of that is I kind of struggle a lot with sometimes like the barrier between like being being an artist and being like a technologist <laughs> right <laughs> and I invariably because of my professional work I spend far much more time being a technologist and like kind of designing performance systems rather than actually designing you know artistic work that piece is something which I feel although I, I really really love the idea behind it I don't feel I've ever actually got it to work properly and I think it's probably because I'm in love with the idea of it as a performance system as opposed to something that I can I personally can actually use to create music right um, so I'm interested to, 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 to maybe potentially release that system and that patch just out further to, to see if like if anyone other than me could make something that was more effective using it well, it actually seems like one of those, you know, there's these little micro festivals or whatever, where it's a festival that ha is built around a specific content or a context, right? Like, you know, we're only going to do pieces that are, f you know, four, four hours long or longer. <laughs> that would or, be an interesting festival. <laughs> right. Or we're only going to be, you know, all the performers have to be in their socks or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, but there are all these things that have like these little tweaks in them. And it seems like doing something where it's like, here's a tool and we're going to try and, you know, get like four different composers and see what they are able to produce. It seems like that kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm always curious about people who who work on systems like this. And again, I've worked with dancers, so I've had some experience, but the, the primary uh, angle of your career and of your work is working on these shows. And... But most of the people that listen to my podcast are musicians. And musicians have a luxury. The luxury of a musician is that you can sit in your mom's basement and hone your craft and get to be a better musician, better on your instrument, or better sight reader or whatever, so that when you get into a performance situation, you've got your chops together, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do you do that when what you're actually doing, the actual performance or the, the even the practicing is with a whole theater crew tapping their toes waiting for you to get your shit together? <laughs> it's, it, it's difficult, yeah. Um, 
it's I mean I guess the, the, the you know you can start kind of start small and I can feel a lot of the things that I did in the early stages of my career before I was before I had like access to you know before I was working on large shows and I've had access to actually kind of you know high level equipment was make stuff that to, to get around limitations that were imposed on me by the fact I didn't have that stuff. Uh -huh. um, so, like for example, the DMAX system, which I mentioned earlier, for doing lighting in Ableton, I wrote that because I didn't. The only lighting desk we had in our theater was one that just did dimmers and wasn't very good at like doing moving light control or stuff for music. Mm -hmm. So I, my my thought was, well, I got a, 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 you know I've I've been asked to do a uh, this huge um, kind of dam university dance show that was like. You know uh, about twenty different acts, and I thought, well, like, if I sit here and program this on on this manual console, it's going to take me months. Mm -hmm. I don't have that long, so uh, therefore, it was I, I wrote that system to get around the fact that I couldn't do it on. Uh, you know, I didn't have the gear to do it um, properly, in a sense. Um, so yeah, I, I guess there's kind of that, and if you like, and that's that's where like knowing stuff like Max and um, and various other software tools is a big help in that regard because you can kind of you can fake your way around a lot of stuff. Well, I mean, let's say fake. It's still it's still valid ways to do things, perhaps just not the way you would do if you had access to more money. Right, right. Yeah. So what is what is the equivalent then of practicing though? I mean, is is there such a thing? Can you? sort of like simulate stuff or if you're if you're designing things do you have ways of simulating what your design is going to do so that you at least are fairly comfortable with it before you show up at the venue yeah i mean if you're doing straight video design there's kind of ways of doing that there's like you know kind of three specialist programs which for doing um th uh, 3d simulation of like a stage set and then you can look at video coming out of um, a, a system on represented on the set so if you're a video designer, there's, yeah, there's tools available for that kind of thing now. If you're doing something kind of more specialist, which is usually what I'm doing, right? like for example, you're trying to interact with a particular piece of equipment that hasn't been built yet or something, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or a system that doesn't yet exist, right. then the first thing I do when working on any of that project is to build a simulator because without that, you can't, you can't test that thing. Right. Uh, and the answer more directly to your question is that often there isn't a way. There is, <laughs> and that's why, unfortunately, like the hours are so long. Tends to be when you actually get onto site in a project, and you actually start working on something, and you realize that everything you've tried before is is not going to work. <laughs> yeah. So, like, one of my questions would want to be, what was the scenario where you like got to a show and you were just scared shitless? But I have a feeling that in a way, the answer is well, the last show that I did. <laughs> because it kind of sounds like that's a big part of what you do is you just have to sort of dump yourself into these unknown and maybe unknowable situations and are just like, well, I got to figure it out now. Yeah, uh, and, and it's it's often that way. I, I've, it's it's the ever the the constant battle between the fact that when you're doing live work, it's, uh, it's so much of it is based on a particular space, and yet access to that space is the thing that is most limited because it's expensive and the, you know you only will only ever pay for the minimum amount of time it is to do something um so yeah it's often like you you spend so much time on stuff when you get there and or, or you spend the time just sitting around doing nothing because everything occasionally everything works <laughs> but it's it's impossible to kind of know beforehand often yeah that's that's unreal i that's a bit of a high wire act and that's that's got to be uh that's got to be a little nerve-wracking so maybe it doesn't sound like something I would be super <laughs> comfortable <laughs> with, but um, I suspect that there are other good people that would be like, that sounds exciting. So if somebody wanted to get into this, what is what is the path that they would take to get into this kind of work? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one for me because I came in at such a weird angle compared to most of my, my colleagues who work kind of more directly in show production. I kind of bridge this strange gap between quite uh, academic audio and, and multimedia audiovisual work and ended and kind of because of the skills I acquired whilst I was studying that ended up doing working in, in a show production environment mm -hmm. um, most of the my kind of colleagues in the show show production world come from kind of like either from you know they've been doing it since they were 16 and they've just gradually worked their way up to you know larger shows right. or they've gone to like a specialist college or uh, training to and studied that specific thing and now that's what they do so yeah I mean, like unfortunately 
I don't really know. I just kind of ended up doing this kind of thing because I was good at it and it was kind of a niche. And like a world where I could come in with my kind of Mac skills and make stuff for people that like they didn't, you know, that, that they couldn't see another way of doing. Right. You or know, maybe like, unexpected, right. I would be struggle to explain how I ended up quite in my current position, but yeah, it's it's kind of absolutely what I what I want to be doing. <laughs> Just not quite sure how I got here. Right. Well, that's that's pretty great. Yeah, this sort of like the funny path to current career seems to be in a way maybe a a common thread for a lot of people because I think our whole the whole media art and technology area is one of those things, it's literally that kind of career path that didn't exist 10 years ago. And now there's like a level of excitement and a level of desire behind it that didn't exist. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's also, a lot of it is is knowing about it as well and knowing that these kind of things exist because right. I definitely didn't know when I was 16 the, the job I'm doing now or what what is sort of a job is kind of like a position or the area of or in which I work now really existed as a thing. Right. Like you could, there was something that you could do and survive. <laughs> In a sense, I used to build crazy systems when when I was younger for like school productions and stuff that, that is in a way weirdly similar to what I'm doing now. But I just didn't know that it was. I didn't know about the area. I didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of look back on it now and think, well, that's you know, I kind of threw it together with the, the knowledge and skills and kind of contacts that I had at the time. But right. now it's you know, it would be it would be really very not just because of the experience I have, but it's like just by knowing that this was a thing. Right, would find far easier now. So I, I think it's, it's partly that as well. It's, you know, as much as uh, as much as I think people desire to go down this route, the especially the live elements of this, and people who do content design for live productions as opposed to like just for kind of TV and video, there are a few people who actually realise that this is an area right. and that there's quite a lot of demand for it. Right. So finally, not in terms of what you do for work, but in terms of what you do for your personal. Uh, your personal art, you mentioned the thing with the the directed sound thing. What other kind of work do you have uh, personally that uh, you think is kind of coming down the coming down the path? what What are you into in sort of like your personal work? the at the, at the moment, I'm looking at the for the uh, the directed performance thing I mentioned, I'm looking at trying to create that in the form of an app. Basically, mm-hmm. the way I used to do it was essentially by getting large multi-channel audio interfaces and with some homemade adapters, letting you plug headphones into the outputs so that I could get sure. enough in discrete outputs from a headphone. Since then, and now that basically everyone has a like a smartphone, like iOS or Android, what I'm trying to do is turn it into something that can be used as a proper distribu- distributed performance system. So, like in, within a local network, so I'm trying to make an app that you can kind of connect to like a server, and then we'll actually distribute the commands and kind of take control of the performance, with the hope that a it can be that can system could be used with a, like a larger group of people, you know, and it presents some interesting kind of possibilities then for like just, you know, a whole bunch of people showing up in a public place, just all and plug their headphones into the system and produce some kind of, uh, some kind of performance. Right. Right. Quite like the idea of it's, I mean, it's much say it's a kind of piece of artwork. Again, it's more about I'm designing before I'm seeing this in the moment as I'm designing a performance system. I don't know what I'm going to do. If I'm going to, if I'm going to make something with it after that, or if I'm just going to like talk to some other people and see, are you interested in like working with this? Right. In a way, maybe the second second part of that I think would be more interesting to see what other people do with it. Well, it's always it's always amazing because you put something like that together and you put it you put it in the hands of somebody and you're like, well, I wonder if they're going to do this thing I imagined in an interesting way. And what instead they'll do is something you never imagined at all because they just, they didn't come in, into it with the perception of performing it your way. So they found their own. And yeah. a lot of times real surprises can come out of that. In terms of other things though, it's the difficulty I have is for as much as I have access to a lot more kind of equipment and stuff than I used to, it's not in the sense of like in the context of a university, I could just like stroll into venues and say, I want to book this, I want to do this here. I don't really have that kind of capability mm-hmm. anymore. Right. So it's difficult for the kind of work the works that I was really interested in doing, which is generally stuff that's pretty large scale and involving a lot of technology, it's actually a lot more difficult to kind of put that stuff on and put it together anymore. Especially when working as an individual, so I'm still kind of looking for ways to on how on like in the future how I can actually do that kind of thing. 
Right. Which, it's difficult. So, but in the meantime, I'm kind of looking at these more kind of that still may be as technologically complex, but with not so many specific demands on pe- on other people's time or equipment or place. Yeah. Or place. Yes, as well. Right. Interesting. Well, David, I want to thank you so much for your time. This is really interesting and really, uh, really eye-opening in terms of uh, not only what you do and, and how you got there, but also what that whole terrain looks like and the and the real changes that that show control is going through. So, thanks for your time and for opening those doors for us. Thanks, Owen. All right, and with that, I'll uh, I'll let you have your day. Thanks, thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Owen. Okay, many thanks to David for talking with us today. It was really interesting to hear more about the world of show control and lighting and all the good stuff in between there. Uh, Sounds like a real fascinating line of work. Also sounds completely unnerving. So uh, it's really interesting to get a view on that from David. Thank you so much for you as the listeners for tuning in and for sharing this and for keeping, uh, keeping on keeping on. I really appreciate it, and I will talk to you next week. Bye.